la mer douce, the sweet sea. Hey everyone, this is Joyce at Medusa was framed. Thank you for popping in once again. This will be another of my series on quirky and sometimes morbid tidbits about the Great Lakes. Today we're talking about Huron, Lake Huron, often known as the Forgotten Lake, the Orphaned Lake. She is the fifth largest freshwater lake in the world. One of the earliest known maps charting Lake Huron in 1656 was attributed to Nicholas Swanson, and he used the Wyandotte people's name, which we call Huron people, for the lake, which was Carignondi. Lake Huron is technically Eastern Lake Michigan, connected by the Straits of Mackinac. She's named after the people we call Huron inhabiting its shores when Europeans arrived. They call themselves Wyandot, Wyando, Wyandum. Her main inlet is St. Mary's River, Ontario. Her main outflow is through the St. Clair River, Michigan. She covers 23,000 square miles in surface area. 9,103 of those are in Michigan. 13,964 are those in Ontario. Her average depth is 195 feet. Her deepest point tracks at 750 feet. On September 11th, September 11th, 1996, was the Lake Huron Cyclone, also known as Hurricane Huron with a 16 mile wide eye. Being from Florida, I appreciate hurricane stories. In 2014, the embarrassingly Alpena Ridge revealed itself due to low lake levels. And in that revelation, 9,000 year old stone structures were found. Hmm. Well, if you watched my video about Lake Michigan or any of the various things that I've done with Andrew Sabrina the Third about Lake Michigan and the bottom of Lake Michigan, then you know that there is a Stonehenge in Lake Michigan. She has the largest shoreline of all the lakes, covering 3,827 miles. She's 206 miles long, spreading 183 statute miles at her widest point, 850 cubic miles of water. There are 30,000 islands in Lake Huron. Most of them are in Georgia Bay. She's the cleanest of all the lakes, expected due to the introduction of specific mussels to accomplish this filtration. There are over a thousand shipwrecks in Lake Huron. Fathom 5 National Marine Park protects 22, and Thunder Bay Maritime Sanctuary protect over a hundred. She is the unique source of a conglomerate jasper known as Pudding Stone. The Ojibwe legend attributes Mishibishu to having its den where the serpent, serpent River flows into the lake. And if you watched my video on Lake Superior, you're familiar with Mishibishu, the water lynx, as they called it, the serpentine creature that was attributed with protecting all of the copper deposits, who could be both a malevolent force or benevolent force 
your actions and intentions determined its malevolence or benevolence. This was the first lake that the Europeans explored. The Benjamin Islands along the North Channel are known for their outcrops of pink granite. Pink granite. Well, I'm not going to go into that in any length, but let's just think about the silicate composite nature of granite and what might make it pink and what that material might be used for. The worst storm in the Great Lakes, the Big Blow, occurred on November 3rd, 1913, with 90 mile an hour winds, 35 foot waves, and shattered the lakes for 16 hours, sinking 10 ships and killing 235 seamen. The actual indigenous people around the lake were Iroquois-speaking lineages inhabiting all along the St. Lawrence Seaway, what is now the St. Lawrence Seaway, what was then the St. Lawrence River, Michigan, Wisconsin, Ontario, and Ohio, known as the Wyandot, Wendot, Wendu, we call them Huron. And they were first recorded by Jacques Cartier in 1534, referencing that they were a matrilineal people building long houses and barrows. Long houses and barrows. Hmm. Hmm. So let's talk a lot about haunted Huron stories. And we'll begin with Dag Wanion Yent the flying head. The story tells of young indigenous men who wanted to fish an area that was considered sacred to the local deity, Wankan Takan. Several elders in the community warned that no fishing or hunting could occur here where a cairn existed for tribute to this deity. The young men argued with the elders, and unfortunately, the most vocal elder was killed. His blood offered to Wankam Tankam on the cairn, and his severed head thrown into the lake in additional tribute. Immediately, the lake began bubbling up. As the severed head rose with wings, running the young men off the area. <laughs> Stories chronicle this area as being haunted and protected by the head. Those who would come to tribute the cairn and Wakantankan would be watched by the head, seeing the head hovering over the lake, coming up as they approach the cairn or the lake. As long as they came in honor, they were unbothered. The head would simply watch and then go back down into the water as they left. Some years later, there were women that were gathering chestnuts and acorns near the location. They had stopped, built a small fire, and were roasting the acorns and nuts. Of course, Wankantankan came up because apparently they were close enough to the cairn to catch his attention. Remembering that these are a matrilineal people, the women were the leader, the elders, in many cases, the decision makers. And it's told that the head came close, that the women saw the head, but they knew that they were there in honor, so they had no fear. They were eating roasted chestnuts and acorns. And the story goes that the head watched in horror and fled back to the lake and had never been seen since. Story tells us that the women who were leaders, being matrilineal, 
eating the acorns might have been mistaken by the monster as eating hot coals and therefore far stronger in power than he could have been. Three different hotels had been built on the site and all have burned down. There is the old Colony Bayport Cemetery. The town that became Ora Elabora was established in 1862 and inhabited until 1898. The cemetery for this town that no longer exists has over 300 graves. 241 are marked. It sits in what is now called Bayport, which is in the thumb of Michigan. Ora elabora means pray and labor, and apparently is a Catholic phrase. This was a German Methodist community. The first year that the town was established, illness hit. A hundred and forty are noted to have died the first year from an unrecorded illness. Men had been called off to the Civil War, leaving women and children and elders. Michigan didn't recognize documentation of death until 1867, so no one really knows how many people are buried there. The city was abandoned in 1898 by best records. This peculiar story warrants his own video. Watch for that. There will be more. All that remains is the cemetery. I can feel the spirits just looking at the photos. Next, while we're in Bayport, let's talk about the Bayport Hotel. Again, Ora Labora became what we now call Bayport. In 1900, a resident of the hotel committed suicide by slitting his wrists, smearing bloody handprints all over the wallpaper. The staff couldn't remove all the blood, so they closed the room off. Cold drafts, voices, screams, and squeaking floors when no one was there continued. The hotel was a difficult one for people to stay in. A gentleman by the name of William Wallace, William Wallace, I've been told I'm a descendant of William Wallace, purchased the hotel in 1907. He auctioned and harvested everything off and tore it down. William Wallace. Now, there's a salt mine under Lake Huron, too. We talked about the salt mine that was under Lake Erie. Did you know there was a salt mine under Lake Huron? Compass Minerals Goodrich Salt Mine. Goodrich, Ontario. And I apologize if I said that incorrectly. It's attributed as being the largest salt mine in the world. Hmm. 1,800 feet below the floor of Lake Huron. Just put yourself in that image, going 1,800 feet below the floor of Lake Huron. Hmm. Open since 1959. The halite, or rock salt, harvested from this quarry is shipped to communities all around the lakes and up the St. Lawrence. They also have a manufacturing plant nearby on shore where they manufacture detergents, plastics, and disinfectants out of the salt. It's 18 miles wide, two miles long, containing an estimated 2.7 million square miles of salt. The mine can accommodate over 400 people with an entire bus system of 30 routes. So you go down to work the mine and you get on the bus that will take you 
to where you need to go to do your job. 30 routes. All of this. All of this. Uh, 1,800 feet below the surface of the lake. Was believed deposited 400 million years ago and was discovered in 1866 by a gentleman by the name of Sam Elliott, no, not that Sam Elliott, searching for oil. Miners sink shafts through the underlying rock, then extract the salt, leaving large caverns with alternating pillars. This is referred to, apparently, as room and pillar mining. And most rooms, caverns, are 60 by 60 feet. Now, Lake Huron, a good bit of its attributed size is due to the three main bays. We'll talk a little bit about those. First, we're going to talk a little bit about Georgian Bay, which is part of the Laurentine bioregion. It's completely within Ontario. And if you've heard of the Laurentine region, it is believed to have the oldest stone on the planet, which means, which means that it has the oldest water on the planet and the deepest water on the planet. The Laurentine bioregion. I'll just leave that there and I'll let you look into that if that sparked your interest. The oldest water on the planet. There are, by the way, several videos about this, this oldest of primary waters. Georgian Bay is 120 miles long, 80 miles wide, encompassing 5,600 square miles. Its shores and waterways have been the traditional domain of the Anishai Anabig of First Nations in the north, and the Wyandot, or what we call the Huron, in the south. It was, for many, many years, an Iroquois-Algonquin major training thoroughfare. Samuel de Champlain also called it La Mer Douce, the Sweet Sea, a large body of water that was fresh. In 1822, it was named after King George the Fourth by Lieutenant Henry Wolsey Bayfield. It borders the Niagara Escarpment, running east to west, New York, Ontario, Michigan, and into Illinois. So now, that comment about it being part of the Laurentine bioregion, and that being part of the Niagara Escarpment. I will leave that to you. Think about what creates Niagara Falls, the unevenness of land, and what the unevenness of land does to water, and what such eruptions from the earth do to the water in the earth. And what happens to that water when it's brought to the surface? And therefore, the water at, under, and around Niagara Falls. And the primary water, the oldest water on the planet, under, in, and around the Laurentine biosphere. Hmm. The Trent Severin Waterway connects Georgian Bay to Lake Ontario. So this is another way connecting the lakes. Georgian Bay to Lake Ontario, connecting essentially Lake Huron to Lake Ontario. Then there is the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which is not to be confused with 
Thunder Bay. But this body of water along the Michigan coast protects 16 shipwrecks in Lake Huron. It's referred to as Shipwreck Alley, the northwest portion of Lake Huron. Due to unpredict unpredictable weather, murky fog banks, sudden gales, and very rocky shores. This is a marine preserve, 290 square miles, all underwater, that was established in 1981. It was the first of 11 preserves established in Michigan's Bottomlands Act in Michigan's attempt to protect the history of the shipwrecks on the lake bottoms. 4,300 4, square miles of Lake Huron is marine sanctuary and state underwater preserve. Hmm. It's run by NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric Association. It was established in 2000. There's also a submerged lake shelf full of fossils and artifacts. And there's Saginaw Bay, which is the eastern side of Michigan which essentially is the space between the Thumb and Lower Michigan, covering 1,143 square miles. This watershed is the largest drainage basin in Michigan and the largest continuous freshwater coastal wetland system in the U.S. We believe that it was named after the Ojibwe word Osaginol, which means to flow out. Wrecks, yes, there are some wrecks. Now we'll remember that the storm of 1913 in November of 1913 sank 10 ships and over 20 were driven aground in that storm that raged for 16 hours, killing 235 and you'll remember if you watched my Lake Superior video, that November is the gale season. So there are over a thousand recorded, 195 wrecks are in Saginaw Bay, 116 are in Thunder Bay Marine Sanctuary, and 212 are in Georgian Bay. The first noted European vessel into the Great Lakes was Le Griffon, also the first ship lost in the lakes, the largest sailing vessel on the lakes at the time. Built in 1679 on Lake Erie near Buffalo. My good friend Andrew Zabrun III has on his Telegram channel quite a bit about Le Griffon being a lifelong uh, New Yorker, Western New Yorker, uh, Lake Erie has always been his backyard, essentially, and he has a lot to say about Le Griffon. There's also just a, a lot on the web, uh, on the internet about Le Griffon, if you're interested in more. Very important uh, point in uh, maritime history. Robert Cavalier, also known as Sur de la Salle, navigated across Lake Erie, crossing Detroit and St. Clair Rivers into Lake Huron. He's chronicled as passing the Straits of Mackinac, took a load of pelts to head back to Niagara, but never made it back. It's believed that Le Griffin was found in Lake Michigan in an undisclosed location in 2021 under 350 feet of water. This was called the Holy Grail of shipwrecks. And obviously the location is undisclosed because they don't want raiders. The Seneca and Iroquois during the time of the construction of this ship cursed it, calling it a threat to the great spirit 
for such a large vessel to be built to take man across the water. And, well, she went down on her maiden voyage. Then there was the Goliath that was built in 1848. On a trip from Detroit into Lake Superior, carrying flammable cargo, why, why, why would all of this be loaded on a ship, I ask you? Shingles, lumber, hay, and, and 180 kegs of blasting powder. Why? <sighs> it is suspected that Sparks from the smokestacks got everything to a light. Explosions were felt for miles. It blew up five miles from shore, and only the cook survived. Then there is the SS Clinton, built in 1892, a freighter. On September 21st, 1924, she left Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, carrying a load of stone to Detroit. She crossed the Straits of Mackinac, hit a gale, and never made it. She floundered. 28 died. Wreckage started washing up on Canadian shores. The diver David Trotter of the Undersea Research Association found it in September 24th, 2016, and it has since been considered as significant a find as the Le Griffon. In 1863, the Water Witch was the fastest steamer on the lake. It was taken down with a hull full of copper and 28 lives. It is since considered a treasure ship, the most valuable treasure ship in the lake. Often known as the terrible tip of the thumb, Saginaw Bay's Point Ebark is a site of much maritime destruction. Point of little boats, Point Ebark. 80 vessels have sunk within 20 miles of this point, the, th the thumb of the mitten, essentially, where warm, shallow water meets the cold, deeper water. Father Louis Hennepin, who traveled with Le Sieur La Salle in 1679 on Le Griffon, mentioned the hazard of these low lying boats. In November of 1966, the Daniel J. Morrill had passed Point Abark going north. She hit a gale of 65 mile an hour winds with swells as high in the ship. She broke in two. Her stern was found two miles away from the rest of the ship. One in 29 survived. He was discovered in a raft 40 hours later with the bodies of the three other crew who had since died of exposure. Now, there are some very unique features about Lake Huron, and I'm, as you know, always interested in weird, unique things. There's a couple things that make here on very unique. And one of them is all the sinkholes, submerged sinkholes. There are entire ecosystems in and around these sinkholes. And I'm going to touch on this very lightly, as of course I do. This is fascinating if you are biocurious nerdy, scientific, curious. This is fascinating. And I read a great deal, but just put down the basics. 
Um, if this is interesting to you, I absolutely uh, encourage you to look into it because there is a lot. So there are several sinkholes, and we will talk about a couple of them specifically, but they're all over the lake. What is known as the Lake Huron sinkhole was discovered in 2001 on accident when some divers were looking for shipwrecks. It was originally believed to be created by the reactions between the limestone and the groundwater deposits dissolving the gypsum through the influx of the fresh water and the groundwater. Now in the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which we know is a home of several shipwrecks and basically it's all protected land, has dozens of sinkholes. NOAA, working with the University of Michigan, developed a drone camera to drop down into the sinkholes that was also able to capture samples of the water and they found that it was very high in sulfates and low in oxygen, which is a perfect habitat for microorganisms. And they found very strange bacterial blooms at the bottom of the sinkholes and around the rim of the sinkholes, purple, white, and green carpets, as they call him, have been living near sinkholes since before the glaciers receded. Cyanobacteria, it's called. And this process is known as chemosynthesis, where a system of an organism receives its energy via chemicals instead of photosynthesis, which receives its energy from light. Chemosynthesis processes are usually near hypothermal vents, which of course, what a sinkhole is, where warmer water seeps into colder water. High temperature and high mineral concentrations. The only thing that have been found there are microscopic worms. Life that requires no light. I just have some fascinating photos here to show you. There's a lot about this. Uh, and if you're interested, please look. Now there's also the Middle Island sinkhole. Again, high in sulfate, low in oxygen. It's known for its purple carpets or mats. It's in 300 feet of water. And there are at least 14 others within 15 miles of the shore of Michigan in an area 15 by 3 miles wide, the width of a football field, in 60 to 350 feet deep water. The Rockport State Park in Alpena, Michigan, which is part of the Alpena Ambersley Ridge, which we spoke about, where 9,000 year old quarried formed stone was found during a low lake period, is an abandoned limestone quarry. And around that quarry are over 12 sinkholes. And around these sinkholes are 400 plus million year old fossils. Hmm. Just some lovely pictures here. Again, if you're interested in this, there is a lot, a lot. Now, a very important and famous part of Lake Huron is Mackinac Island, the island in the Straits of Mackinac. On Mackinac Island, 80% of motor vehicles are banned. It is and it has been and still is the traditional home 
to the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Owada. Their names for the island, all of which mean big turtle, sound like Mishimakanak or Mishimakano or Mishimakimak. On and around Mackinac Island, fishing camps dating 700 years before Europeans have been found. And Mackinac Island is considered the home of the Geechee Manitou, or the Great Spirit. It is the burial place of generations of tribal chiefs from these First Nations people. The Straits of Mackinac separate the upper and the lower peninsulas. It's three and a half miles wide, 290 feet deep, completely freezes over in the winter, connecting Lake Michigan to Lake Huron. The Ottawa called this the Michilamaknak. It was a vital shipping route but for the railroads. Most of the straits are set aside by the state of Michigan for the Straits of Mackinac Shipwreck Preserve that includes 148 square miles, where there are 15 known wrecks. There are three lighthouses, and it is patrolled by the National Guard. This is all First Nations land. All of the Great Lakes are First Nations land. But I would say to what I have learned in my brief research on the lakes thus far is the holiest of places is an island up on the Canadian side known as Manitowan Island. It's the largest lake island in the world, with a hundred islands of its own, encompassing 1,068 square miles. The Ojibwe name for this place is Manidouwaling. And the Ojibwe and other Iroquois First Nations people speak of this place as the home of the cave of the Greek spirit, Kichi Marabu. Mackinac Island is noted as one of the homes of the Great Spirit, and there is a cave near the base of Manitowan Island that is known as the Cave of the Great Spirit, where the Great Spirit lives. And if you look at a map, given the alignment with Mackinac Island, it draws consideration of just what the terrain was like before it was all flooded. Take a look at a map. Serpent River's mouth is said to house the cave of the residents of Mishibishu, Mishibishu, the sea links of Lake Superior. The Loch Ness Monster, if you will, of Lake Superior that was known to guard the copper deposits. The Great Water Links. Known in Lake Superior, Michigan, and Huron. There is an island between the Ontario shore and Manitowan archipelago that is known as home to the Ojibwe of Anishinaabane First Nation. Much of this area includes mainland area as well that is all First Nation reserve, unceded land. 
Between the 1950s and 1990s, unusual quartz orbs were washing ashore, which the indigenous people called the Great Serpent's Eggs and heavily warned against disturbing them or collecting them. Analysis revealed many were uranium-coated. They're commonly known as kettles, Huron's kettle. And there is an area called Kettle Point in the Anishabali Nation. Again, unceded southwestern territory of Ontario, the southern shore of Lake Huron. The southern shore on Lake Huron. It's named Ashahudina by the Chippewa. Tales of serpents fill this upper Huron area from the straits across to the Serpent River Reserve just mentioned. In 1976, several folks on the shore watched an unknown couple of serpentine creatures, 20 to 30 feet long, frolicking just below the surface. In 1978, Sheboygan residents reported watching two, perhaps 40 to 50 feet long, about 600 feet from shore, playing together. He called the sheriff, who came and confirmed. <laughs> in 1910, on a fishing day with his grandfather, they were rowing out to fish onto what was then a dammed region created for the lumber industry near the Straits of Mackinac. In a body of water, Grandpa found a tree to tie the rowboat on, but as he went to tie the line, the tree moved. The grandson locked eyes, it is told, with the opened eyes of the creature that then simply slithered into the water. William Gautier, the grandchild, notes the head passed the boat, their boat, when its tail was still on the other side on the bog, undulating away very quickly. Manitoulin Island is home to six Iroquois cultures, including the Ojibwe, Odawa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. In 1952, archaeologist Thomas Lee discovered Shaguida, which he named, dating 10 to 30,000 years ago, now protected. Wiki Winkong First Nation is an unceded reserve in the Mountainland Island area, nicknamed Wiki. They call themselves Anish in Abal. In 1836 and up to 1862, the largest portion of this land was set aside as unceded reserve. It's currently home to the oldest powwow in eastern Canada. And we're going to close with a little bit about the Alpena Amberley Ridge. Again, there is so much about this, if you're interested in dorky, archaeologically minded like I am. This is marvelously fascinating. Um, there's a lot to read, if you're interested. And this all ties in to the Laurentine biosystem and the oldest rock in the world which means the oldest water in the world. I should say the oldest surface rock in the world. Still the oldest water in the world. It runs from Alpena, Michigan to Point Clark, Ontario. Revealing stone hewn and organized structures dating 9,000 years ago. Discovered in 2014 when 
lake level sank so low that it became clearly visible. Since 2005, over 50 stone structures have been discovered along this submerged ridge. University of Michigan is leading the ongoing study. So imagine, this has been buried for 10,000 years. In 2013, obsidian shards were also discovered around it in 100 feet of water. The acceptable, <laughs> accepted <laughs> story is that these were caribou blinds, structures that were built to trap caribou and the obsidian shards found around it, which are said to have come from volcanic regions in Oregon, are noted as being evidence of these being caribou blinds. Now that might make sense to you. But if it doesn't, if you're like me and you question everything, then I encourage you to look at the stone structures in South Africa that were believed to have been pens for livestock, that several people have come to show were cymatic resonators part of a larger grid down in the regions around Adam's calendar. So were these caribou blinds, were these indigenous heathen people over 9,000 years ago moving stone and building all of this just to trap caribou? Hmm. Shown very sophisticated constructions, V-shaped leads, circular structures, just like South Africa, and cobble pavements, cobble pavements leading from circle to circle. Do you really think that that was all for hunting caribou? They appear to be near the top of what is now a slope. Why don't we know more about this? This is the first time I've heard of this. Why don't we know more? I wonder if people in Michigan know about this uh, in more than a quirky way. Drop 45 Drive Lane is a very complex hunting structure, a newly discovered portion of the Alpena Amberley region, the most sophisticated, they're calling hunting structure, found beneath the Great Lakes so far. Hmm. So for someone like me, who spent her college years studying archaeology, this is very fascinating, stimulating, and interesting. But I will let you decide if you want to look further into that or the blooms of the sinkholes or anything else that we touched on. Interesting. In fact, it was the biosphere around the sinkholes that led me in to Lake Huron. I was going to do a video about Lake Huron, uh, like I've done the other lakes, but I didn't know where I was going to start or what my main way in 
would be. And it was the sinkholes that was the main way in. And the other things I found were a result of that, being the quirky-minded person that I am. So thank you for spending this hour with me as we looked at La Mer Douce. I hope you are having an absolutely beautiful morning, afternoon, or evening. I thank you for your attention and likes and patronage and comments. And this is Joyce saying ciao, and I will see you soon. <laughs>